So Bethlehem Church, you hear us say it all the time, you see it everywhere, we're a church for all people. And one of the groups that gets our most attention is the next generation. We believe that the future of the church is the now of the church, and the church is only as strong as our next generation. So whether it's kids ministry, student ministry, building volunteers, being involved in local schools, raising up Christ followers, we are committed to the next generation, but also in developing the next generation of pastors and leaders. So we decided that this weekend to close the Broken Crown series out, we would let our next generation voices stand up and speak. So many of you have gotten to know our high school pastor, Drew Chaining, and he's gonna close this series out. He and his wife, Megan, have been great teammates, great team members, and we're glad for you, excited for you to hear from Pastor Drew. So go ahead and get your Bible, your pens, your notes, get ready, because Drew has a word for the Lord for you today. Well, hello and welcome to Bethlehem Church. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Whether you're joining at the 316 campus in our north venue or maybe you're in the south venue, hello over there. Maybe you are watching online, you're vacationing somewhere, or it's been a long week. We are so glad for you to join us today. If you're used to hearing that in 211, um, over at 211 today, we actually have somebody teaching over there. One of our pastors, Pastor Joseph, is over there today. And so if you're like, hey, you forgot one. No, we didn't. We're on purpose. They are someone teaching over there today. If you've missed, though, any of the last few weeks, we are actually in a series, again, called Broken Crowns. But what we've been doing is something very specific. We've been looking at Old Testament kings. And we've been trying to learn some very practical and modern lessons in the seasons of life that we are in when school is out and summer is continuing. And so that series uh, was started by Pastor Matt Pyland, our executive pastor, carrying it through the last handful of weeks while our lead pastor, Pastor Jason, was away on vacation. And so just huge props to him, huge thanks to him on doing that. And next week we start a brand new series that Pastor Jason will be back for at the helm. And so excited for him to be back. But if you're like, hey, who are you? Never met you before. Before. Um, again, my name is Drew. I've only been here for about five months. Um, my wife and daughter and I, we moved from St. Louis, Missouri about five months ago. In fact, I have a picture of my wife, Megan, who her and I have been together for six years and going strong. And then this is a photo of my daughter, Olivia, and this is way too much cuteness in one photo. Um, in fact, I have a sneaking suspicion in about 10 years, I'm in trouble. Um, just throwing that out there right now. In fact, if you're trying, if you're ever like, hey, I wonder if that's Drew's kid, here's how you know if my daughter's around. She'll say these two words, she'll go choo choo, and then she'll say fist bump. Like, that's how you'll know that's my kid. And, uh, and so, what's funny though is that as I'm kind of learning this whole parent thing, we're only two years in, so I got a long way down the road. Um, I'm starting to realize a lesson that's just true for probably all of us, and it's this. Is that, have you ever kind of realized that in life, it just feels like it's always something? Like, it's just always something in life. The moment everything's going strong, the moment everything's doing really well, your dishwasher breaks. You know what I mean? Like, the moment that it couldn't get worse, you get a flat tire in a situation where you can't, you know what I mean? Like, it just feels like it is always something in life. And we had a season of that in the Cheney household right before we were moving here. It just seemed like one thing after another after another. And, and I had a day where I was like, you know what? I'm going to turn this around. I'm not going to let all these things get to me. And so when I have seasons like that, here's what I do. I go play tennis. Tennis is my way to vent. And so a Saturday morning, I set up some tennis in the morning. I'm excited. It's going to be a great day. My wife says, you know what? If you're going to go play tennis, we're going to go to the park. We're, I'm going to take Olivia, walk around the lake. Like we'll, we'll both get a workout in. So I'm like, great. Sounds like an awesome day. She goes, takes Olivia, gets in the car, all is well. She's on her way. I get my tennis racket. I get my water, all the things that I need, lock the door, head out of the house. It takes me about 30 minutes, 28 minutes to get where I'm going. Well, 26 minutes into my trip, I get a call from my wife. And I thought nothing of it. I was like, I'll call her back in a little bit. I get a second call. And, and here's why this is important. We have a rule in our household is that if we miss a call, not a big deal. But if we call twice, it means something wrong happened and we need to talk. If it wasn't bad enough, I got a Mayday text message that said, answer your phone. And in my head, I thought, 
oh, no, this isn't going to be good. And so I call her back, and this is my response. I'm like, are you okay? Did something happen? She says, um, she said, yeah, I'm okay. I'm like, is Olivia okay? I'm freaking out a little bit. Is everything fine? She says, oh, no, no, we're good. I said, well, then what's wrong? She said, you locked us out of the house. And I thought, Oh, gosh, this couldn't get any worse. I'm literally pulling into tennis, about to, so I turn around. I head all the way back, but i got to be honest with you. It's in this moment a thought comes to my mind. It's not a thought I said out loud, so I get points for that, but it's a thought I had. And my thought was, just because she texted me she couldn't get in the house, does that mean I need to go back? Like, like you need me to drive back. You can't, like... Like A11, like, you know what I mean? You can't forget. And so I, I didn't say it, though. I just thought it, and I went back, and I drove. Well, I was in such a hurry driving back to the house that there were some things that did not come to my mind. Like this. I didn't think that speed limits applied. Um, just not something I thought of. And so I'm driving back, and, and I got this friendly little light show in the back of my, my mirror and, and I'm looking, I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, what a horrible week. Now I'm about to get pulled over, and I locked my wife out of the house. This can't get any worse. Well, the, the police officer comes over to me and says, sir, are you okay? You were going kind of fast, and here was my, he said, do you know how fast? And this was my response. I said, I said, no, I have no idea. And he said, probably not the best choice of words. So he's looking at me, and he said, are you okay, though? You were going like 20 miles over the speed limit, like 920. I'm like, I'm like was it that fast? Like, I, didn't, he, I was like, I, didn't know, I knew it was fast, but I didn't know it was that fast. And, and he looks at me, he says, is everything okay? I said, oh, you won't believe this, officer. I said, it's been a horrible week. And to top it off, I just locked my wife and my kid out of the house. It's 40 degrees, and they're just chilling outside of our house. I said, it cannot be a worse week. And he just starts laughing at me. Like, he just starts cracking up. And he said, oh, my gosh. He said, we have all been there. He said, I completely understand. He said, I'm not going to give you a ticket, but this is kind of funny. It made my day better. And I'm like, thank you. I appreciate that. Made your day better. And so... So I go home, I unlock the door, my wife's not happy, my daughter's crying, it's not good. And I go back to tennis, I'm about half an hour late, and I'm like, okay, this can't get any worse. And as I'm going back to tennis, I'm already 30 minutes late, I, you would not think that this would happen, but the same police officer who was on one side of the road switched sides of the road, and I'd love to tell you that I did not get pulled over a second time, but I can't tell you that. In fact, he pulled me over a second time, and he walks up to the car laughing, and he says, Sir, I've never pulled over in my history the same car in an hour. <laughs> I'm like, well, thank you that I could give you entertainment today. Um, luckily, he did not give me a ticket. He felt horrible for me. He knew what kind of day it was, and so it, I was just like, wow, this couldn't get worse. But does it ever feel like in life that this is how it is? It feels like it's always something, there's always something going on, and the moment you need it to not be bad, it is bad. Something happens to you. I feel like that's where we are in our series, Broken Crowns. I feel like every king we've looked at, no matter what good things they did or what bad things, we always get to the point in the story where it seems like they always short-circuit the process. Like there's a moment in time they make a decision, and instead of continuing in the purpose God has for their lives, it kind of throws it all off and we never see them fulfilling their whole purpose and what God has planned for them. That's kind of where we've been over the last few weeks, if you have missed any of that. Today, though, we're going to look at our very last king, and we're going to see if the some things that happen to all of our other kings, if it happens to this one as well. And so our goal today is to see if we can dissect three key truths from our story today and our king. You may be saying at this point, who is it already? Tell us who our king is. Our king is a king who took over the throne from a guy, his father, by the name of Jehoaz. Jehoahaz. And he takes over the kingdom, the throne in Israel, in the city of Samaria, and he inherits something. He inherits an army that's depleted. He inherits resources that are barely there. And if it's not bad enough, there is one more something he inherits. There are multiple empires looking to take him out on day one. And so I don't know if any of our other kings went through that kind of thing, but it's bad. And so who is our king? Our king goes by the name of King Jehoash. 
King Jehoash, you can actually find more of him if you want to follow along. In 2 Kings, verses, in 2 Kings chapter 13, we're going to look at verses 10 to 19-ish, and we're going to camp out there for the most part. Um, if you didn't bring your Bible and you're like, hey, I have a phone, though, you can actually go online um, to YouVersion and download the Bible app and follow along there as well if you would like to keep up. We start in Kings 13, though, um, in 2 Kings 13, and this is kind of like some context we are given about King Jehoash, all right? It's kind of a weird, a weird start. It starts this. In the 37th year of another king in another city, Jehoash, son of the guy we just talked about, Jehoahaz, he became king of Israel in Samaria, which we just said. And he reigned for about 16 years. So over a decade, he's the king. It continues. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not turn away from any of the sins of another king way before him in time. Now, here's the weird part, is that I feel like we've read this before. He did evil, he did not turn away. And in my head, I'm thinking, how many times do you have to see it go wrong in history before you change the outcome? And I would ask us the same question. How many times does your wife have to ask you to take out the trash before you hear her at times. It's the same thing in this model apply. But here's the part at the end that we're looking at. He continued, meaning Jehoash, he continued in the same ways. He continued in them. Now here's the weird thing. I like stories to be in order. Like, I don't like to read chapter 3 and then go back to chapter 1. I, I like things to flow really, really well. In the story of Jehoash, we kind of get told the end game to start off with, which I find strange. After we're told how he does the standard that he is king of, we're actually told this. We're told that if we want to find more information, we need to go to another book in another place and we'll learn more about him. Now, I find that weird because what a weird, like, thing for us to look at a king where you would think, well, that's the story. He doesn't do well. And then we're told to go somewhere else. Well, the weird part is not that. The weird part is that all of a sudden a story is told to us. A story that probably you may have done what I've done where I have passed over this story because I thought it was already over by the way I read the beginning. In fact, this story really allows us to get a look into Jehoash and the area of the kingdom of Samaria. But here's what it does as well. The reason why we're reading it is because God thought it was important enough not to throw it in a different book. And so today, we're hope, our hope is that we can get three key truths from this story of our king, King Jehoash. So let's pick up in 2 Kings 13, 14. Now Elijah, you're like, wait, I thought we were talking about Jehoash. We are. There is actually a guy by the name of Elijah who's a prophet at this time. And our king goes to see him. This, a, this prophet, he'd been suffering from an illness on which he would one day die from. But Jehoash, king of Israel, he goes down to see him and we weeps over him. Okay? He greets him like this. My father, my father, he cries. Now, I don't know about you, but um, there are some things that I don't do when I meet people. When I meet people for the first time, I shake their hands and I say, hey, what's your name? Tell me a little bit about yourself, that kind of thing. Somebody I know, I say, hey, man, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? I give him a big old hug. That's just, that's just how I am. You would never go up to a complete stranger, I think, and say, hey, you, give me, let me give you a hug. Like, no, we don't, that'd be weird and creepy. Um, and if you do that, then I retract that statement. Um, but he goes to him like he has a personal relationship. And it doesn't say this in the Bible, but theologians actually think that the reason why our king greets Elijah with such familiar language is because they were familiar. In fact, Elijah was probably a mentor or a counselor early on in our king's life. As he's trying to figure out how to do life, Elijah is a part of his story. But we see something in this is when he says, my father, my father, he is coming back to a place of his youth for one very specific reason. In the humiliation, in the distress, in the season that he is in, he is absolutely desperate to go back to a time when everything made sense. And I don't know about you, but there are times in our life where we go back to things of before when things were not complicated, when something wasn't everywhere over our lives to make things make sense. Sometimes we do that with God as well. And so our, our king, he goes to 
uh, our, our king goes to the prophet in a desperate situation, and this is basically what happens. He throws a spiritual Hail Mary, hoping that Elijah can get him out of his problem. Let's pick up in just a second. Uh, we'll continue this. But let's look at key truth number one. It's this. is sometimes if you're desperate enough, you will change, which is why key truth number one, if you're taking notes, is this. Change involves desperation. Change involves desperation. Um, I just went to the beach recently, and going to the beach, I had a fundamental thought um, when I did this, as I thought, I have to put on a bathing suit. And the thought that went through my head was, am I out of shape enough where I need to work out before I go, or can I just, like, am I fine? And, and I've realized before I went, I was like, you know what, I'm okay. I'll, I'll just, we'll, we'll just be whatever it is. But have you ever done this where you thought, oh, I got to go to the beach in about a month. I need to start working out. I need to find a bathing suit that fits right. I need to make sure that when, when people are looking like, I look, I look good. We kind of do this is that if you're desperate enough, you will fix the equation. For instance, if you're going to the beach, you may say, I'm going to work out. I'm going to start doing P90X. I'm going to pull my quad muscle trying to think I could do that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we do this where it's like if we're desperate enough, we will do whatever it takes. In fact, maybe for you there's been a season where you are desperate enough in your marriage where you will do whatever it takes to turn it around. There's a season in your life with your kids, your family, you're like, I will do whatever it takes to make sure that this does not continue in this pattern. In our finances, we say this too. I don't like where we are. I am desperate enough to work later, take on another job or work another shift. I will do whatever it takes to change our current situation. We actually, though, do this with God too. We say, God, I will do whatever you want. If you do this for me, I promise I will not follow forward in these footsteps. If you do A, I will do B. And here's why we have those thoughts. It's this, is that people don't change until the pain of present circumstances outweighs the pain of change. People don't change until the pain of a present circumstance outweighs the pain of change. So like in a moment where you're like, this, I don't like change, I don't wanna change, but this is so bad, I will because I can't do this anymore. That's actually exactly where we find our king, King Jehoash. But there's actually a time that I remember doing this. Um, I remember when we had our daughter, Olivia, Megan and I, I literally the first month, I just, there were things that I didn't know. There were things that I didn't know how to do, which is even more important. Like, I, I didn't know the whole hold the neck thing. I had to like, like someone had to teach me that. Um, I didn't know that um, like laundry, there was a lot of it. Like, I didn't know these things. Um, I also didn't know how to change a diaper. I, didn't, I had no idea. And I remember my wife, after the first, like, week or two of us having Olivia, she had changed all the diapers up to this point. I was like, shh. And uh, I thought I could prolong it a little bit, but she said, hey, Drew, I really need you to learn how to change a diaper. And I said, you know what? I got this. I, I've never changed a diaper in my life, but I can do this. I got it. And so I had this philosophy is if I fake it till I make it, she'll never know. All right? That's what I thought. And so I take our daughter into another room. I'm changing her. And I don't know if you've ever put a diaper on somebody, but there's like ends and there's clips and there's wings. And I didn't know they fly. and Like all these things I didn't understand. And, and I look at her, uh, my daughter, and I'm like, I just, I don't know. And my wife comes in there one day, and she's like, okay, I got this. Like, learn another day. So another day comes. She's like, I need you to change our daughter. I'm like, fake it till you make it, Drew. I got this. And uh, something happens. Something that I did not think was holy happened. Something that was not of God did not, like, it happened. But I didn't know things shoot out of your kids. Didn't know this. It's my first experience, and all of a sudden, something that is, it had to be the spawn of Satan, shoots out of her in my direction, and all I can say is this. All I do is hold my hands out and say, ah! And my wife hears my, my manly plea, um, and she, she comes in the room. She's like, what's going on? Oh. She's like, go shower. Go, sh go, go shower. And do and you know what? In that moment, I became very desperate to never have that happen again. I started reading books. I started asking questions. I started putting diapers on stuffed animals to fix the problem. It got that bad. And, and here's why. It's because I was desperate enough to not have a situation happen again. And that may be funny, but on the other side, you, you've been in this situation before. In other areas of your life, you've been desperate enough to make sure that hurts and pain of the past don't happen for the future, so you act very specifically. Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 actually has a verse about this. It says, where there is no guidance, people fall. 
Where there's no guidance, people fall. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. See, that's actually why King Jehoash goes to Elijah, because he is tired of doing it the way he's been doing it. He is desperate enough to see things change. He's seen many kings before him fail. He does not want to be that king. And so he looks to Elijah and says, tell me what to do. And I don't know if you've ever done this in your personal life before, but if you've ever gone to somebody seeking wisdom and counsel, and you say, hey, tell me what to do, what are you looking for? You're looking for an answer. Like, Tell me the key to the one plus one, two. That's an answer, okay? Like nobody wants to do one plus one, what's the answer? And they say, go read a book. Like that doesn't help us in our current pain of situations. And that's unfortunately what Elijah tells our king to do. Our king wants comfort. Elijah, though, gives him instruction. How many times have you ever been in a season where God, you're like, God, I want you to show up. Tell me what to do. And he says, oh, I want you to do this process. I want you to start with step A, B, C, and D, and then we'll talk. Like that happens in our life, and it happens to our king. And look how Elijah instructs our king. He says this. Elijah says, all right, you want to fix the situation? You want to be out of your pain? Go get a bow and some arrows. Now, if I'm asking a question to somebody in this room, I say, hey, I I need some parenting advice. And you say, hey, you know what? Go get a bow and arrow. I'm like, wait, what? What? Like, that doesn't mean, like, that's a weird thing. Get a bow and some arrows, he says to him. Then he says something else. He said, take. He says, take the bow in your hands, he says, to the king of Israel. He continues, though. There's more steps. He says, when he had done so, Elijah puts his hand on the king and said, okay, now you've done all that. Open the window. Open the east window, he says. And so our king opens the window. And then he says something else. He says, well, shoot the arrow, Elijah says. And he shot. He says, if you do all this, though. If you follow these steps, you will completely destroy the enemy that you are facing. The arrow of victory over Aram, you will win. Everything will be okay. You will 100% change the ship is what he says into his king at that moment. But here's something that we have to realize is that everything you need for victory is in the, se- in the season you're in. It's always within your reach. Everything you need in the season you're in, it's in your reach. The difference is are we willing to take action when it is? It's always in our reach, but are you willing to actually take action? This key truth number two, if you are taking notes today, is it's this. Trust, it requires action. Trust requires action. For instance, you guys did something when you came in today. You probably didn't even think about it. It was so natural you to trust that you didn't even think about it. You found a seat, and what'd you do? You sat, right? You you looked at a chair. You said, oh, I think that'll work nicely for me today, and then you sat. You did not play spiritual hokey pokey with your chair this morning. That's not how it worked. You found it and you sat. It wasn't like the one foot in, one foot out, oh, one cheek down. One, no, no, not that one. Like you didn't try to sit in your seat. You sat because you trusted the fact that it would hold you when you sat. Now, if you've ever sat in a chair and it's fallen, you may have had second thoughts, okay? But most of us sit in a chair like it's normal. Here's what you would never do. You would never come into a room like this. You would never come into a room like South. And you would never come, if you're watching online, you would never sit at a chair at your desk and say this. You know what? I'm going to try to sit in a chair today. Yep, today's the day. I'm going to try to sit in a chair. That one right there, that's going to be the one I try to. Oh, but I don't know. Oh, I think so. Oh, but I I know. Today's not the day. Nope, not going to do it. We would never do that. What would you do? You'd sit down in a chair. You sit or stand. That's your option. There's no trying. But when it comes to trust, why is it we say things like this? I'm going to try to trust. I'm going to try to put God the center of my life. I'm going to try to be a better husband. I'm going to try to be a better father. I'm going to try. But you know what? If I try and I fail, well, then I can say, well, you know what? I tried. Why is it that we have moments where, we, where it requires trust, it requires action, but we say things like this, as you know what? I tried, so therefore I did it. See, some of us find ourselves where we say, I'm trying to trust, but that's not how trust works. You either do it or you don't do it. There is no trying. Just like a relationship with God. It's either you're in a relationship with God or you're not. There's no middle trying. It's one or the other. I remember a story recently, um, because we've only been here for five months, um, I sat in, uh, my my wife and I were just having some conversation. Should we move to Georgia or not? This is home for us. We grew up in this area uh, about an hour from here. So we love Georgia. It's one of our favorite places to be. And so we were sitting in Missouri at that time. Like, should we move? I don't know. We love it here. We love the people where we were at. ah." And I remember saying these words to my wife as I said, look, 
Bethlehem Church sounds amazing. What's going on there sounds awesome. Like God's doing something really cool. And if we get to be a part of it, that's amazing. But I said these words out of my mouth. I said, but I really don't want to pack boxes and move. And my wife, in all her grace and wisdom, looks at me and says, are you telling me you're not willing to be faithful because you don't want to pack a box? Oh, shoot me now. Thank you, Pastor Wifey. I appreciate that. Oh, Jesus, juke out the wazoo. Like, I'm in this moment, and I'm like, yeah, that's, I guess, exactly what I'm saying. And after us having a heart-to-heart conversation about faith, which I guess I needed in that moment, um, I remember her saying, like, hey, Drew, this is such a great opportunity, and you know it. And I realized that. I said, man, to be a part of a church like this, the people are amazing. They're kind. They're compassionate. They're loving. They go out of their way to care for people. They're volunteering. They're doing some amazing things there. I was like, and to be able to be a youth pastor at a church like this and to impact next gen with ninth through 12th graders, finding value in them and leading them and caring for them and making sure that they know that they are not wasted opportunities. They are the future. They are the right now who can make a huge difference if they just put God at part of their lives at the very center. I was like, how can I miss out on that? And my wife says, okay, so you're not going to let the box get in your way now? I'm like, all right, shut up. I, I get you. But you know what? This is what we do, isn't it? We do this. We say, you know what? I, I'm not willing to act out in faith because I don't know the end game. That's actually Jehoash. That's why he goes to our, to our prophet. But notice what our prophet continues to say in 2 Kings 13, 18. He says this. He says, there's more instruction. He says, after you heard all those things, now you got to do them. Like, you heard me say what to do. Now you got to act on those things if you want to win. If you want to beat your opponent, this is now what you got to do. So he says, you need to take the arrows, and the king took them. Elijah tells him, now you need to shoot them out the window. You need to strike the ground. And so he says, okay, I will do it. Here's why this is so important. The actual act of shooting the windows or shooting the arrows out the window is this. It's a process of faith. Elijah wants to see if our king is desperate enough to follow faithfully going forward instead of the way he's falling right now. But here's also what he's doing. He wants to know something very poignant. He wants to know if our king will be obedient and be submissive when it comes to God's calling on his life. That's what this is about. It's a process. And i got to be honest with you. Up to this point, I'm feeling pretty good about our king. Actually, if it wasn't for knowing how this ends, I'd say, oh, my gosh, he humbled himself. He stepped out without pride and went to somebody in his life who was making a difference. He asked questions. He wanted to come in saying, I just want to fix it. I want it to be better. I feel pretty good about our king if this is where it stopped. But unfortunately, just like many kings before him, he throws off the plan of what God has for him, and he takes something into his own control. Look what it finishes in 2 Kings 13, 18. It says, after shooting him out, he struck the ground. He struck the ground three times, and then... On one, two, three, let's say the word stop. One, two, three. He stopped. Now let me, let me just check on this. Um, Elijah tells him to get. He tells him to take. He tells him to open. Tells him to shoot an arrow out. Tells him to strike the ground. I don't know about you, but I don't see the word stop. And all of a sudden, Elijah sees our king do something that was not instructed. He took it upon himself to stop. And let me ask you this question. Do you ever do this when it comes to your relationship with God? Do you ever have your seasons where you're reading your Bible, it is going strong, but you're reading it for a purpose. You need God to show up. You're saying specific prayers, and you're like, God, I need you in my life. I need you to heal my health. I need you to heal my marriage. I need you to heal my relationships. And then you're like, God, it's been three weeks. Where are you? God, it's been six months and you still have not shown up. I feel stuck in this moment. If you're God, where are you in this moment? Because I'm here and I'm stuck. Let me ask you this question. Is it that you're stuck? Or is it actually that you stopped? Is it that you're stuck? Or is it that you actually stopped? See, that's where our king finds himself. He stops after three arrows, and it tells us something. 
It actually tells us something about his character. And you're like, how does it tell us something about his character? This is what it tells us. It tells us that although he had the desire to change his situation, at the end of the day, he was only satisfied with partial results. He wanted to change, but he was satisfied where he was. That's happened to us before in our life, hasn't it? It's happened in our relationship with God. But look what happens next. In 2 Kings 13, 19, this is the reaction of our, of our guy, and it's this. Elijah was so angry. Elijah was so angry with our, with our king. He says this, you should have. You came to me, I'm on my deathbed, you're asking for wisdom, and you stopped. You should have struck the ground five or six times. Has this ever happened in your life? Like somebody says, you should have taken the trash out. You know what I mean? Like, is that right? I told you six times to clean your room. Like, you know what I mean? Like, do I need to tell you seven? Like, like this happens a lot in our lives. Elijah gets so mad. You should have done more, but you chose to stop. He continues, he says, if you would have done this, you would have defeated the army of Aram, the king of Aram. You would have completely won. You would have destroyed them. But now you will only defeat it three times. You decided to short circuit the blessing, the calling, the purpose on your life because at the moment you decided three was enough. Now here is a question that I always have and we'll get to it in a second. Is why does that matter? He shot three. Why does it matter? Why is the prophet so mad? And it's this. It's key truth number three. It's that for a lot of us, opportunities only last so long. So we need to take hold of our opportunities. We need to take hold of our opportunities. See, the, the prophet's so upset because our king decides to stop the opportunity, to stop what God's doing, to stop the wisdom and the instruction he was given because that's enough for him. And do you know what our king thought? Our king thought the only battle he was fighting was against his enemies like people, cities. He thought everything was external. But here's what our prophet knew. Elijah knew this already, and it's this. It's not in your notes, but you can write it down. It's that our biggest battles that we fight, they don't stand in front of us. They actually stand within us. The biggest battles we fight, they don't stand in front of us. They stand within us. See, Jehoash is struggling because he doesn't realize that the battle he is facing, the fight he is up against, is not people. It's himself. How many times have you fought someone or something thinking they were the problem when reality was it was something inside our hearts? See, our king goes to Elijah in a prideful, humiliated way, and he says, I need help. And Elijah gets so mad because he stops after three arrows. I thought about this because I was like, oh, what, why is this such a big deal? And actually, Leonard Ravenhill says this about it. It says about opportunities. The opportunity of a lifetime, it must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity, which means this. Trouble doesn't last forever, and unfortunately, neither do opportunities. Trouble doesn't last forever, but neither do his opportunities. But that doesn't answer the question, why is our prophet so mad? Why is Elijah so mad? He shot it three times. He did something. Like for any of us who were like, but I tried. Like I took one step. I took two steps. I, like I did something. I didn't do nothing. I did something. But yet here our prophet, Elijah, is so mad at our king. And there's something in this story that I did not realize until I started doing some research. If you look back in history, actually, they didn't have cannons. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have assault rifles. They actually fought with these few weapons, with knives, swords, shields, armor, bow and arrow. Like, that's, that's all they had. Rusty little blades and, and some trinkets to, like, keep it. It's like a 50-50 chance of you surviving. And so they go into battles with these things. But if you were an archer, what you'd be handed is a bow, but you'd also be handed something else. You guys ever heard of a quiver? You know what that is? I actually have one in case you've never heard of a quiver that one of our awesome volunteers is going to bring out. Um, inside of this quiver, this is where you would keep your arrows. Thanks, Jimmy. This is where you would keep them. So, like, when you were given a bow, you'd also be given, like, a quiver. You would never just have arrows sitting around randomly. Like, and when I'm reading this story, I'm thinking this. I'm thinking that our prophet gives him one arrow, two arrow, 
three arrow, but it doesn't say that. I'm assuming that. What he was handed would have been a bow and arrows. And where you kept your arrows was in a quiver. The reason why you were given a quiver is this, is that because you're in battle, you don't have time to really reload. There's no, there's no guns back then. You, you have no time to, like, lock everything back in. It's just this is what you have. How weird would it be to shoot an arrow and then go chase it? Like, that wouldn't work. You'd be done. Like, you would hand them a quiver full of arrows. And here's why, here's the tension in this story, is it's that the reason why our prophet gets so mad with King Jehoash is this. He shoots once, he shoots twice, he shoots three times, and even though he has the opportunity to shoot more, he puts it aside. Let me ask you this question. God has given you exactly what you need. He's given you instruction to win, but how many times have we shot three arrows with the opportunity to shoot more and we've put it aside. See, that's why Elijah is so angry. He's angry because in this moment, our king could have turned around the trajectory. Our king could have completely turned around past failure after past failure after past failure. He literally could have stopped the cycle, changed what was going on, moved forward. He could have been the guy that literally fixed this situation of bad king after bad king after bad king. But what we learn about our king, King Jehoash, is this. He was given the opportunity, and he put it down. Because he thought that these were enough. And I have to ask the question, why didn't he shoot nine times? He probably has about 30 arrows in his quiver. Why didn't he shoot 15 times? Why didn't he shoot 30 times? Why is it that he didn't shoot every single arrow he had the opportunity to shoot? And it's this. Elijah saw something in our king. It's something that sometimes we have to be careful of in our own selves. Is that sometimes in our willingness to fix things, there's also a heart not to go through with instructions. And let me ask you this question. Has God given you everything you need in your quiver, every arrow you need to win, everything that is at your disposal, he has handed you, but you decided to stop short of the calling on your life because you were okay with partial results. I wonder this, I wonder if sometimes the reason why we can't hear God, I wonder if there's sometimes the reason we can't see God the reason why we don't know where he is in our lives, I wonder if it's because we stopped. We just stopped. I remember there was a season in my life um, where my wife and I were going through a lot of things. We were thinking about moving here. Our, our family was, it just felt like we were at the doctors all the time. It just felt like it was a season I couldn't, I couldn't stand anymore. I felt like there's too much weight on my shoulders. And I'm like, I'm supposed to leave our family. I'm supposed to lead, you know, my wife. I just feel like I'm getting everything wrong right now. And so what I started doing is I started playing it safe. Um, I started taking less risk and less chances. And I came to a point where I was like, gosh, God, what is going on? And I remember my wife sent me this little quote. She said, it was from this guy by the name of John Shedd. But it's this quote that says this. A ship in harbor is safe. But that's not what ships are built for. You were built for so much more than safe. You were created for so much more than missed opportunities. God had a plan in mind creating you. I don't care if you're 90 and I don't care if you're 12. There is destiny and future and promise over your life because that wouldn't happen if you weren't here. God specifically spoke your name into existence and you are here. It is not on accident that any of this happened. But there is something that we have to realize is that just because you shoot three times and put the rest of your arrows down, you need to hear this this morning, church. That does not mean you cannot pick up your arrows and do it better the next day. 
that doesn't mean because you shoot three times that this is all gone, your opportunity is wasted, and there is no more. And here's how I know this, because God sent his son to literally die on a cross so you had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. It's called the word grace. You don't have to do anything for it. You don't have to earn it. All you have to do to decide it, if you want it, is this, is that every time you shoot three arrows and put your quiver down, will you pick it back up and shoot again tomorrow? What determines our faith is not just going to church and not just reading your Bible and not just praying. Those are great things. But sometimes what determines your faith is when you do get knocked down, will you still continue firing, even when you don't want to? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. And Lord, there are so many people in this room probably who are in seasons of their life where it just feels like it's always something. There are weights and there are pressures and there are tensions that a lot of people in this room feel whether it's in this season or in the seasons coming or behind. And Lord, we look at this king today and we see these lessons from him about desperation and about taking actions and opportunities. But Lord, the reality is at the end of the day is that your message, your life, your son literally stands for one specific thing. It's that you can never miss out on an opportunity when you're involved. If we say no today, we can pick it up tomorrow because that's what your love stands for. It stands for unlimited grace, unlimited opportunities, unlimited hope, unlimited potential that all we have to do is continue to pull back the bow and keep firing in your name. Lord, for people who've given up this morning, for people who have been struggling in the season, Lord, Lord, put a banner of grace over them, put a banner of confidence over them that, Lord, you're not only who you said you are, but you also did what you said you'd do. Lord, we love you, and we can't worship you enough because of that. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.